Hello, Embers. Welcome to Ember Exchange. I'm Dylan. I'm Jill. I'm Heidi. And I'm Nick. Today we're having a bit of a philosophical theological conversation. Um, specifically, we are going to be talking about the differences and the components associated with three terms that we've said a lot, but I realized that we never officially defined them. Mm -hmm. So I thought it'd be good if we had an episode to just go through these three different things so that us and the embers are all on the same page. So when we inevitably use these words in the future, we all know what we're talking about. And those three words are egalitarianism, complementarianism, and patriarchy, or biblical patriarchy. We're going to talk a little bit about what those mean, how they relate to each other, and you know some different thoughts that we have. So uh, with that, why don't we stoke some conversation? Well, let's dive right into it. The way that I uh, decided to frame this conversation was to essentially divide out the researching burden a little bit. So I assigned, I didn't assign, I, I let you guys volunteer for which of the three you wanted to look into in more detail. We were voluntold. Yes, you were yeah. voluntold. And, and so with that um, kind of context, uh, Nick is going to be primarily taking the bulk of the discussion on egalitarianism. Heidi generously volunteered to take a look at complementarianism. Mm -hmm. And Jill will be leading us through the discussion on patriarchy. And I'll be here slacking off like I always do, <laughs> um, trying to, you know, engage with the things. But we're all going to engage in all the topics. So why don't we start off with the first one then, Nick? What is egalitarianism? So egalitarianism is the doctrine that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. That sounds pretty nice. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds and, I, and I've ragged on egalitarianism in previous episodes, so that makes me sound like a horrible person. And it we does. should continue. Yeah, we should continue. <laughs> you know what it also sounds like, though, to me? What? DEI. Mm, DEI. That's very interesting. So okay. so keep going, Nick. So, Give us a little bit of the background. A little bit of the background I found out. Um, we're going to obviously talk about it from a Christian perspective, but the term came up from philosopher John Locke during the English Enlightenment period. Um arguing that every person is basic and equal moral rights. So the Christian, the Christian version of it would be men and women have equal roles. So with that being said, it's going against, in my opinion, my, my view on things, it's going against scripture on the way that God had men and women set up in their roles. Uh, I, I think we, we probably will tend to share some opinions there. Okay. Let's give them as much benefit of the doubt as we can here. Yes. So I I have also heard that those who are Christian egalitarians don't just like throw the Bible in the trash. They try to use scripture to mm -hmm. back up their opinion. They do. Mm -hmm. To give a little bit more additional background context there, um, it seems to me that historically it was also core to the Enlightenment, the feminist movement, and the civil rights movement, which uh, sounds an awful lot like that. We, we talked about this in a previous episode when you use nice sounding words to describe mm -hmm. something that isn't that. So mm -hmm. saying like, oh, everyone has equal rights. Yeah, I guess kind of. Like if you read the U.S. Constitution, there's a lot of egalitarian ideas there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what is not said is, and so that means feminism and that means the Civil Rights Act and right. these sorts of things that we would say, now hold on a second. Let's, let's think about these things more in greater detail. So, yeah, m maybe at, at first blush, egalitarianism has some like positive notes to it. But when you go into the specifics, and, and I like how you said for Christian egalitarianism, this is looking at the relationship between men and women, particularly in a marriage. Um, you know, there's maybe some things that give us pause. Mm -hmm. But but what did you find? What are the, the biblical backings, I guess, for uh, people who hold this perspective? So a lot of people, um, well, the people who hold the Christian e egalitarian view um go back to genesis and say that men and women were created equal interest men and women both suffered from the fall equally too so that was another argument they had weird yeah and it's also another argument they had was this this is paraphrasing of course but like they said that the uh, holy spirit works through men and women equally okay so i know that one of their like favorite proof texts is galatians three twenty eight. Yes. Would you be willing to read that for us? Absolutely. That's like their staple verse. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So, okay. so they're, they're saying that being one in Christ Jesus, that is mm-hmm. equivalently eligible for salvation, which I think that all three of these categories would say that everyone is equivalently eligible Correct. for salvation. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. And we would agree yep. with that also. And we'd, yep. we'd tend to agree yeah. with that. They would then take that the step for, further and say, so therefore they're equal in all other aspects. Yes, yes, yes. and that, okay. that sex isn't even really considered anymore. Sounds like um, potentially some individuals in the <laughs> modern sphere who would say that that's also a construct, which is hey, interesting. Um, hmm, okay. I was going to say Genesis 127, where they're talking about God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Right, so that it, one it, would it's... say that they both share the image of God. Correct, yeah. Which we would also, I think that all three positions yeah. would also say yep. that men and women are equally bearers of the imagio Dei. Mm-hmm. I've heard the argument, though, that this is a little unrelated, sort of, but that women are unequal because they are made from a man, even though man was created from the dirt or the dust. You but. patriarchist, you. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there because I think there's some pretty... Oh, sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> shadowing. No, yeah. we'll because there's, I think, some pretty clear um, verses in First Corinthians okay. that talk about... Yeah. A little sneak peek. Um, specifically that thing that man was not created from woman, but woman from man. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So how, how you can read a verse like that and say, ah, that's not what that actually means is always a little bit weird to me but somehow somehow the egalitarians manage to do that the other one that i saw that they use uh, as a a reference is priscilla and aquila Uh, in the new testament they are this couple that serve with paul i think they were also missionaries Um, and they get their names are always mentioned together they are mentioned six times and three of the times Priscilla is mentioned first and three of the times Aquila is mentioned first. And so that proves that men and women are equal. Yes. That's clearly. one of their arguments. Uh, and then the last one that I came across, and I don't know if maybe you saw this one also, it was Ephesians 5.21, which yep. is interesting because if you read Ephesians 5.22, which I think will come up later in one of the yeah. other uh, topics here, they'll, they'll read, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and say, aha, that means that men and women ought to submit mutually to each other. Mm. Um, interestingly, if you submit, or if you read literally like one more sentence, it says wives submit to your husbands. Yes. And then as now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands and everything. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that we're, we're not necessarily just dunking on egalitarians yet. We'll get there. Um, that's, that's one of the, the proof texts that they like to use there. Mm-hmm. Yep. I found something that said that the first Christian egalitarian, I believe, was Anna Oliver, who's a Methodist who demanded full clergy rights for women in 1880. So checks out that she was a feminist. And then the first uh, Christian egalitarian organization uh, was established in the United Kingdom in 1984. So it's a very recent um, sort of position to take. So that's kind of the position, I think, well-defined and some decent yeah. understanding of where they go in scripture to find support for this. Yep. So a few people that I came across that I think are maybe more well-known, there, there weren't a ton. And the, the list that I found was, you know, some people I had heard of and most of the people that I had, I had not heard of. But the ones that stood out to me were William and Catherine Booth, who founded the Salvation Army. Mm-hmm. Apparently mm-hmm. they are egalitarian uh, in their beliefs. And then the one that actually was the most interesting and gave me pause uh, was N.T. Wright, who is a theologian who has oh. done, uh, you know, written some systematic theologies and some books. I think he's generally pretty con- reformed. Mm-hmm. Which which does surprise me. So anyway, um, it, he was just also on the list. So I didn't go and like exhaustively read all of the literature that he's ever written to validate that, yes, he is in fact an egalitarian. Mm, sure. Um, but... That was a name that, okay, if I'm going to be looking at N.T. Wright in the future, I might think like, okay, let's double check and make sure that he is actually thinking straight on these Mm -hmm. things. So anyway, I'm sure there's more, um, but those were the ones that stood out to me. I just find it interesting that we as a society, I think generally, if you're not a Christian and you are interested in being a Christian, you probably would be inclined to be an egalitarian if you're a woman because 
in the rest of culture, men and women are viewed as equal and it's seen as a good thing when there's a woman in leadership. And so why would we not have women in leadership in the Bible? So when we go from culture to Christianity, it does, it's distinctly different, right? And we see that difference as a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the egalitarians say that we're equal in the sight of God. But for some reason, women are not okay with that statement. We need, we're equal in the sight of God and in earthly power Mm -hmm. and authority. And for some reason, we need that. There's a direct tie back to, I think we mentioned briefly, the curse of sin, right? Both man and woman were cursed for sin. Mm -hmm. I would disagree with the egalitarians who say that they were cursed the same because I think that when you read it, it's very clear that they had different curses. Mm -hmm. Men were cursed to work by the sweat of their brow. And then on the flip side, for women, it was pain and childbearing. But the other piece of it that I think people skip over is that her her desire will be for her husband. Mm -hmm. And that to me, really encapsulates this the idea of the feminist movement, which seems to be rooted in this kind of egalitarian mindset. So this is something I noticed. In my Bible, it says, your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Interesting. You have... Uh, ESV. ESV. Okay. Mm-hmm. NIV is your desire will be for your husband. So contrary and for seem to be opposites, unless I don't understand I'm with the you. definition I'd of contrary. I seem like they're opposites. Yeah, so this would be an interesting exercise in versions. Um, So the NIV is a thought-by-thought. ESV is a word-by-word. So probably the original Hebrew word is more closely in contrary to her husband. I think when the NIV says, your desire will will be for your husband, that can be a bit confusing. I've always taken that to mean not like you want the same things that he wants and you're working together. I've taken that to be a covetous spirit. You want what he has. Ah, Uh, Okay, that makes sense and would go along then. Your desire shall be contrary to, so in opposition to. Right. So if your husband has a certain role or a certain task, you want that for yourself instead of being satisfied with that which God has given. Ah, Then we shouldn't be surprised about egalitarianism. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I I, I think that you're exactly right. (laughs) Thank you, Nick. Uh, I think I have a better understanding of egalitarianism, what it means. If somebody were to hold that position, I would kind of know where they're going in the Bible to find that. Mm-hmm. Cool. You might have so, a few rebuttals for them. But... Yeah, the yes. rebuttals could be uh, complementarianism. Yes, I, yeah. think, I think very much so, yep. which, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that complementarianism rose as an opposition to egalitarianism. Exactly. So really the need for a term like complementarianism came in direct opposition to egalitarianism. And so this arose in response to that because complementarianists uh, still believe in the distinct differences in roles between men and women. And so they needed to come up with some sort of term for that because patriarchy wasn't cutting it for them. (laughs) It's offending too many people. Exactly. And so one of the primary like organizations that really elevates complementarianism is the Gospel Coalition. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I got see? quite a, f- a bit of my information directly from Gospel Coalition okay. uh, from this woman named Mary Cassian, I believe is how you pronounce her last name. Okay. And she's the author of several books, including Girls Gone Wise in the, in the World Gone Wild. And True Women 101, Divine Design. So she is clearly very pro-women. She's pro-women in ministry, but not necessarily in leadership. Okay. As long as she's going along with the complementarian thought process. Mm -hmm. Um, She teaches women's studies and modules at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville. And the reason that I took much of her article um, to be truth is because she attended the name the concept meeting that happened in the in 1988 where yeah. the word complementarianism actually came out of. Oh, okay. Hmm. So she was there. She was there when it was invented. Exactly. Uh, from the beginning. So complementarianism, if you are typing it out or seeing it as a word, it's very long. It is. <laughs> 
Do not get overwhelmed. Just, you know, sound it out. Complementarianism. That was a lot. It is a lot of syllables, but we're here for it. Uh, there's a reason that it's called this. And it the word complementarianism, as you can imagine, is derived from the word complement. Now, this doesn't mean compliment. Like I say, <laughs> Nick, I like your shirt today. It means... I, I do like your shirt. <laughs> it, it's a very I nice shirt. <laughs> However, complement means essentially um something that completes or makes perfect yes with an e instead of an i there's a spelling difference yeah. exactly yeah. uh so counterparts they they make each other whole so uh as you can imagine they believe that men and women complement each other and make each other whole even though they have distinct and different roles i think i saw somewhere there was an the imagery used was like a balanced scale. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they balance each other, a husband and a wife. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not tremendously opposed to this so far. No. Yeah. Yeah. And at face value, it seems really great. They still hold the idea that the Bible gives us that men and women have distinct roles. And they also say very clearly that men and women are of equal value in the Lord's eyes, uh, which I, I don't think that we would disagree with any of that i also don't think that egalitarianism complementarianism or patriarchy would disagree with that with the equal value 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 god's eyes but the equal or the non-equal roles the distinct roles yeah is what makes complementarianism distinct and a direct response to egalitarianism Mm -hmm. as mentioned there was this council on biblical manhood and womanhood who came up with this term and so there are a couple of pros and some cons that i see with holding this view when it comes to biblical womanhood and um The pros are that men are not superior to women in value. That's what they believe, that men are not superior to women in value, which is a good thing. Men have a responsibility to exercise headship in their homes and church and family, and Christ revolutionized that definition of what that means. And complementarianism does not condone the patriarchal societal oppression of women. So that's good, too. Like, we don't want oppression of woman. Now, I don't know if I agree with the word patriarchy in there, but... S- saying that patriarchy implies oppression. Implies of oppression. Exactly. Correct. I'm um, also interested, uh, you said something to the effect that the definition is changed by Jesus or something. What was that? Yeah. So it, they said Christ revolutionized the definition of what this means. Okay. That I'm women are not the means. second sex, essentially. So Christ, Christ was saying that women and men are equal in value, which is true because when... Right, he died for the sins of all men and women. But but, but he, that's that was true prior to Christ yeah, that also. Was, it yeah. was. However, in society, women were looked at as like the second sex, as lesser in value. And Jesus, while he still had 12 male disciples, distinctly male, he had women in his like larger gathering of disciples He touched women who were considered unclean, and he advocated for them in many ways, which was countercultural to the time. Is that because God instituted it that way before Christ, and then it changed when Christ showed up? Or that was the way that society was in the culture that Jesus came into, but not because that was what God of the Old Testament prescribed? Because right. people were sinful then as well. So when we say right. patriarchy of the Old Testament, yeah. the implication is that means that women are of lesser value. But I don't think that you can make that conclusion. That's that's just what it feels like it's implying. Jesus did do all of those things. Right. But was he changing something or is he reiterating something? It's a good thought process to go through, right? Because I do think that complementarianism, while it's a nice sort of new-ish, it's only been around for 35-ish years, Um, it's a nice term. I don't entirely understand why it needs to exist. Interesting. Okay. Because um, they say that technically patriarchy simply means a social organization in which the father is the head of the family. 
That sounds like what you just described with complementarianism. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But since the 1970s, feminists have redefined the historic term and attributed negative connotations to it. Uh Uh-huh. Right. So nowadays, people regard patriarchy as the oppressive rule of men. Correct. Mm -hmm. Which I'm like, okay, that might be true, but do we need a new term Why don't we just conquer the old term? Why don't... Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Why do we have to shake it up? Why can't we just say patriarchy actually is a good thing? Because they kind of contradict themselves by saying, technically, yes, this is what patriarchy is, and we agree with that, but patriarchy is regarded as as a misogynistic system in which women are put down and squelched. And that's why we rejected the term patriarchy. But it's not the term's fault. It's not the term's fault. So I'm like, yeah. why do we need this whole complementarianism I agree with what Dylan word. said. We take the old and conquer it back. Mm-hmm. So what's really interesting to me is that, so there's a number of people, and I assume that you have more people that you're going to list who mm-hmm. support these things. Mm-hmm. A lot of them fall into the category for me of, uh, to use a term, nuance bros. Uh, Does that make sense? So it's like they have an infinitely nuanced perspective on everything and so they're not they're not egalitarian but they're not patriarchs patriarchists and so but you you're gonna have to listen for like three and a half hours for them to fully detail out to you exactly what they think and if you then try to describe it back to them they'll be like well you're close but see actually and it's just like this hair splitting like when i say that I, I actually really mean. mean like come on yeah yeah unfortunately i know what you're talking about so yeah and i'm not saying there are those that would throw you know all nuance out with the bathwater and the baby I, I don't think having only bare knuckled views on everything is always correct mm-hmm. i think that we nuance far too much I think there are some things where it's just say like no it's it's called patriarchy and i don't care that the feminists have ruined it as a term right right Right. So I don't. So anyway, that so like it does not to surprise be a, me. Yeah, it's like a, it's just being scared of the word. Yeah, it doesn't Especially, surprise me yes. that those these people right. felt the need to nuance out this other word that's not patriarchy, but kind of it's patriarchy. Yeah. And also, I think it creates a slippery slope that doesn't need to be there. Okay. Can you elaborate? Um, because complementarianism, while they still have the distinct roles between men and women they it can get really hairy really fast with what that actually means like they stick true to that they should only have male elders and male pastors but then there are a lot of well-known female teachers like jen wilkin Mm -hmm. who are very strong Mm -hmm. complementarianists correct and it's like yeah i think like a lot of the popular i mean Basically, any popular female that is any in T, a part of TGC is a part of right. any large theological group is going to land in definitely complementarianism. Right. They, they if can't not be, full egalitarianism. If not full egalitarianism, and, right? Allison Beth Stuckey, Sadie Robertson Huff, mm-hmm. they're, they all have to land in that camp. Technically, the Kellers land in that camp. Yes, Tim Keller. Yep, Tim and Kathy Keller. And, and my thing with that is how do we look any different than the egalitarians then Mm. like the woman doesn't have the label as pastor is that what does it but but you see it's not the same because we didn't apply the label to it and so in my very nuanced perspective it's okay or they're only preaching to women but like you can't really control your audience these days it just creates a lot of gray area and i'm honestly wrestling through like is it okay for women to be teachers in a social media capacity without a male there and and things like that are good things to think about. But I think we don't parse out those biblical truths because we have this complementarianism word that we can say, oh, this is fine and that is not and move forward and allow us to slowly move towards egalitarianism because that's what the culture Mm -hmm. is doing. So that's Mm -hmm. what Christianity will likely do. Interesting. You mentioned the like you can't control your audience. Sure, if you want to point to Titus and say that older women should be teaching younger women, teaching what is good, no less. Correct. Then Very broad category. Okay, but you know for certain that men are going to hear it. Mm-hmm. And how many times are, are a woman is a woman gonna, you know, you know, send that 
real or whatever to their significant other and see like, oh dear, see, that's why, that's why you should be doing that. Or that's why mm. she, she said, and she's teaching me how to be a good wife. So that's, that's now my excuse. Right. But that's also not a very, I would argue that's not a very submissive way to go about living your life either. Totally. So, and, and it's not that I disagree with complementarianism. I would probably say that's mostly the camp that I am in like the truth that men and women have distinct roles is a good thing to say mm -hmm. it's just a matter of if we're just using giving that lip service or if we're actually mm -hmm. holding mm -hmm. fast to the truth that the bible says about that right and then um so it's good to have a distinct difference between egalitarianism and something else i just don't know if that something else is should be complementarianism right. right i think that's fair um yeah. but complementarianism is pretty good about the distinct roles in marriage that the woman should be submissive to the husband um, which is countercultural, and that is biblical and good and then also the roles within the church um again they get hairy especially with social media and things these days but uh just distinctly male elders and no female pastors um which, which, which actually though things. isn't isn't necessarily true because the southern baptist convention the sbc is yeah. dominantly uh dominantly complementarianism but they just went through a whole thing where they did not reject women being Correct. ordained exactly so you so can just end like up with saying, women ordained and claim yep. to be complementarian that exactly. slippery slope of okay now mm -hmm. we're we, we were just on one side of that line and now we're towing it and right jumping ship but yeah. but the I, I do like the word um even though it's long even though it's <laughs> long and it's can be intimidating i think for anyone just reading it once you kind of get used to saying it it's okay but um i i like the word because men and women are supposed to complement each other i think it's a high level concept that the bible has within its deep meaning but it just gets hairy with the culture. I, I think to describe my two concerns with it, I would first point to the verse that says that woman was created for man, not man for woman. Or, mm -hmm. other, or I think it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. Man was not created for woman, but woman for man. Mm -hmm. So to me, that says, yes, they complement each other, but the complementing is not horizontal. Okay. If that makes sense, right? Man was not created to complement woman. Woman was created to complement man. It's a it's a directional thing. Sure. Where when you say they are created to complement each other, then it's I think you're exactly right. It's bidirectional, yeah. and you're leaning extremely close to mm. that egalitarian mindset. Yeah. Right. Um, the other way that I would describe my, one of the challenges I have with it has to do with kind of, they have a, a catchphrase um, that has some more thousand dollar words in it. Right. Did you come across that phrase? I did. So the catchphrase is uh, often used to describe complementarianism and it's that men and women are ontologically equal and functionally different. And so ontologically, I... <laughs> me being the wordy person that I am, had to go look up ontology. <laughs> I did too. Yes. To know what that was. Yeah. And it just seems like it's the study, the philosophical study of being. So like, what is a thing? And so when it's, when complementarians say that men and women are ontologically equal, but functionally different, to phrase that differently, I would say that as men and women were designed the same. So they're, they are ontologically the same but their roles that they are assigned are different. And this actually goes back to, I brought this up when we did our split episode when I was talking with Nick, the difference between men and women, I would say, are designed differently. Yes. And not just assigned their roles. So that means that men are designed to be leaders and are therefore better at it than women. Women are designed to be childbearers and rearers and caretakers of the home yeah and they are better at it than men are because not because they were assigned a role they were created as two generic blobs of humanness and then oh this one has these parts you get this role this one has these other parts you get this role no but fundamentally not just in the 
partially in the physical design of men and women, but also, right, we believe that we're more than just our the stuff that we are. We're spiritually, mm -hmm. spiritual entities as well. That part also is designed differently. It, I mean, even in New Age things, there's this idea of the feminine energy and the masculine energy. Which is so, I mean, you cannot escape the creation that God has put inside you, right. even yeah. if you try. You can't. Right? No. And so people wield and deal the... <laughs> <laughs> the feminine and masculine and try right. to figure all that out, how to attract the perfect person. So and do, they use that power yeah. that we inherently know that we have. And, so, and and we know where it comes from. But so right. to say then that men and women are ontologically equal, I think sells short the difference in design. Which yes. is interesting because when I was going through this, I also had the phrase, right, ontologically equal and functionally different. And I said... In other words, men and women have equal value. That's how I read it. Okay. Because I was like, we inherently are both being, we're both created, and we are both created by a God who loves us. So we have equal value and God loves men and women equally. It's Which how, is true. That's how I read ontologically equal. I concur that they, they have equal value. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that all three categories, as we've said a number of times, would concur that equally eligible for salvation the angels are equivalently happy when a man is saved and it's when a woman is saved. Yes, right? right. But I think I do think that in the broad nuance associated with complementarianism, if you can nail somebody down on a position, they would be less likely to hold the designed as opposed to the assigned. And, and it is, again, it's gray because they like mm -hmm. to make the things gray. Right. So they would be a more along the design thought process but they're very much under the truth that men and women are different physically because uh, when i hear design yes. i think like design like physical design yes and but we are more than just physical beings right so that so distinction we the, our design difference extends deeper than just physically what parts does a man or a woman have mm -hmm. it, it extends to yep. the the spiritual component which a i think a complementarian would look at a the spirit of a man and the spirit of a woman and they would say those are ontologically equal or the same whereas i think that potentially we would say that no they are designed differently at the spiritual level too yes right. okay that makes sense were there other people that you found popular people that you want to list as ascribing to this perspective the big one that i know is john piper Yes. Yep. He's like, everyone knows who John Piper is if yeah. you're if moderately interested in theology sorts of things. John Piper comes yeah, up yeah. a lot. Yep. Um, Tim were there Keller. Other? Tim Keller. And pretty much every female person that you see on yes. social media. Because they, they have to be. They couldn't be <laughs> they patriarchists. Couldn't. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that when we get into patriarchy, it'll be interesting to see what it truly is and what biblical patriarchy means mm -hmm. to see how that aligns or doesn't align with complementarianism. Yeah. I had two more people that I just wanted to throw under the complementarian umbrella, which were... Thought we were going to throw them under the bus. Yeah, we can do that too. <laughs> umbrella. The yeah, umbrella, yeah. the bus. That's nicer. Whatever you'd like. Um, Wayne Grudem and John Frame both would be complementarians oh. apparently. And for those of you who don't know, that's fine. If you are into systematic theology, they have written two of the most mm -hmm. popular systematic theology books, uh, Wayne Grudem and John Frame have. Like, But I mean, N.T. ended up under egalitarianism. Uh, N.T. is also a systematic mm -hmm. theology guy. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, okay. Which is that interesting. Crowd. So interesting. there you go. Hmm. If you're reading their yeah. systematic theologies, this yeah. is what they generally would support. So Yeah. Hmm. So to compare i guess and contrast a little into the patriarchy i'll start with the definition the dictionary definition um actually rooted from the greek word patriarchaeus is potentially how you pronounce that p-a-t-r-i-a-r-k-h-e-s definitionally it is the rule of the father um some other root words being pater or i guess it probably is pronounced potter an arche, so the last portion of that word, which is father or chief of a race, and the arche is the domination or authority um, part of the definition. Uh, socially, it was 
defined as the social system giving primary power dominance and privilege to men, and that can be really in all categories, so politically, educationally, um, employment, etc. I think, obviously, we've already brought up some verses, and I will probably bring up similar ones um, or different halves of verses that other the others have seemed to decide to read one verse and they didn't read the verse in this verses after or potentially before. So patriarchy, I mean, I think everybody has probably heard of it. Historically, it's just kind of been always. Yeah. Uh, eat the patriarchy, kill the patriarchy, death to the patriarchy, <laughs> yeah. right? It's right. so always, always the context you hear it in is right. feminists raging about the right. patriarchy. So you've right. got ancient civilizations, you know, Greece and Rome. Um, an interesting one that the feminists like to point out was actually blaming it at the origin of agriculture uh, about 12,000 some years ago because they said that was the game changer mm-hmm. uh, when it came to defending livestock and your crop. Men were better at it no surprise there. And so then men were better at protecting their livestock and crop, which meant they were better farmers, which then meant they could make more money. And then men with more money attracted women. Just like today. Just like today. (laughs) 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 So definitionally, uh, the rule of the father is kind of the true definition of patriarch and i guess there's nothing really scary there we can really realistically point back to early or late 1700s when the word patriarchy kind of got a bad rap and then it just went got worse from there honestly uh starting with a lady named mary wollstonecraft um she was pretty clear in a book called a vindication of the rights of women of woman sorry in 1792 that there was such as a thing as quote the tyranny of men Mm. then about 60 years later it took about 60 years for that to kind of become a social term that patriarchy was equated to the tyranny of men Mm. And then social structure kind of brought light to this whole like matriarchy versus patriarchy. And then we're hitting into the 60s, 70s and 80s and feminists were raging and on campuses calling out patriarchy. You had Kate Millett and she was teaching sexual politics and how patriarchy, death to the patriarchy. Then you had Rosalind Coward and a class or book a combination called patriarchal precedents and literally all of these women were just bashing on how terrible patriarchy was. I bet if you were to, you know, move them into the modern era, they would all have like blue hair. (laughs) Certainly. The primary goal of the feminists when they were fighting or they're trying to death to the patriarchy over here is they were equating patriarchy to women's, the suppression of women. Mm -hmm. And, Which is, okay, sorry, the suppression of women, though, because we're going to talk about what patriarchy is. Correct. The thing is that the things that patriarchy is, which we would say are actually good things for the most part. Right. They would still call that suppression of women. Correct. So, so Mm -hmm. yes, it's, there's, there's some bad faith labeling, right? Correct. Some falsehoods, but they also, it's the same as if, you know, somebody wants to label something that is a sin as not a sin because they want to get away with it. It's right. the reverse of that. They want to take something that is good and say, that's horrible, so I'm going to lump it in with all this other bad stuff. They right. still don't like the thing that it actually is. So it's not just a, yes. oh, if they only knew what the real definition of patriarchy is, then they would be on board. That's not the case. They still hate the thing that is good. Correct. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I think that also modern day, right, we have some unfortunate examples there as well where modern day voices have i for lack of a better term shot themselves in the foot with the whole patriarchy when feminists are loud and proud and we're on what the fourth wave of feminism at this point or who knows are we only the Mm -hmm. third i don't know i think it's the fourth fourth, technically anyway who's even keeping track? yeah who's even keeping track so if you if you look at some of the faces and also voices modern day voices of kind of the death to the patriarchy 
A big one was the Me Too movement because they're claiming that if you're a patriarch, then you're only using women for their bodies and you're getting away with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and Believe then, all women. Right. Believing all women. And then you look and they say, again, not only is patriarchy equivalent to women's, the suppression of women, but male supremacy, which in patriarchy, yes, the rule is to the father and the father is a male. Mm-hmm. Uh is also equivalent to white supremacy. So they're throwing out some of those oh, $1,000 so words. Yep. Are you a misogynist? You're yep. also a racist. Correct. So now, Love exactly, it. throw out some more of those $1,000 words and everybody is ready to beat down the doors on it. Um, in biblical patriarchy, unfortunately as well, we've had some modern day voices that haven't maybe been the best representation. A few that have been in support of biblical patriarchy that have also gotten bad press for... For all for being bad for people. For being bad people. <laughs> admittedly. Yeah. Uh, would be in 1998, there was a thing called the Vision Forum, and they taught the, quote, tenets of a biblical patriarchy. Uh, Doug Phillips was the president, and he confessed to inappropriate sexual conduct. Dylan mentioned earlier the Southern Baptist Convention has kind of now shifted away and has decided, yep, women are fine to be pastors and then also leaders in the Southern Baptist Convention as of probably the last decade decade as well, faced some serious allegations in the sexual misconduct area again. Um, then you have, you know, Duggar's 19 Kids and Counting, which was a pretty popular TLC show. The the point being that there's a lot of people who have been uh, tangentially or directly associated with the biblical patriarchy Correct. movement who have then fallen under scandal. Yes. I would uh, put out there that that's because there aren't that many people, at least popular ones, associated with the, the biblical patriarchy perspective. And if you were to look at egalitarianism or complementarianism, you could find probably more people who have also fallen under similar scandals. But because the feminists would like nothing more than to drive patriarch, biblical patriarchy into the ground, all you ever hear about are the bad actors. Mm -hmm. Correct. So a a few interesting points from those that would support biblical patriarchy and have not fallen under scandal. Mm. Um, Pastor Doug Wilson is a pretty popular pastor in Idaho. Um, He has a pretty big uh, following, I guess. He actually knew Doug Phillips of the Vision Forum from 1998 as well. And his statement following was a few different things and that I think were important. And that is bad men will sin always Mm -hmm. Uh, it it doesn't ruin patriarchy it wasn't patriarchy's fault like doug phillips did a bad thing and he was bad Mm -hmm. he could have been complementarianism and the scandal would have still happened it it would have been swept under the rug but it would have been swept under the rug it wasn't because he was a part of the patriarchy or representing that um he uh also mentioned a line that i kind of liked was that Yes, there are a lot of verses um, in the Bible, which we can go through here in a second, that support biblical patriarchy, but a misinterpretation that should be made clear is that men are not a blessing. They are not the blessing, but they are called to be a blessing. So they are called, specifically, patriarchy asks a lot of men and it holds them to a high standard Mm -hmm. and it should hold them to a high standard because they are carrying the mantle and the rule is to the father. They are called to rule their home. Mm -hmm. That is a heavy weight. And that sounds a lot like what Nick and I talked about too, when we were talking about, you know, how we've changed in relationships Yep. Yeah. is just understanding the weight associated with what it means to lead a family. It's not yeah. like you get to be a king and order people all around and right. you just have a wife who serves you hand and foot. No, right. like not just financially responsible, but also spiritually responsible for the well-being of your family. Correct. Yes. And so his final note, specifically when the Doug Phillips scandal came out because Doug Wilson was close to him, um, his 
kind of last note on that was it doesn't matter what, but using that, that responsibility, uh, as a pretext for abuse is just absolutely vile and unacceptable. So, but it shouldn't ruin patriarchy because it wasn't patriarchy's fault, Mm -hmm. right? Like bad guys were going to do bad things regardless of whatever umbrella they landed under. A few other modern voices would be like R.C. Sproul and sort of a newer up and coming denomination would be the CREC, which is a... Yeah, patriarchy, patriarchal. They come, out of, they come out of the Presbyterian Correct. tradition, but mm-hmm. they aren't. A, a lot of churches that would have would have been in the Presbyterian thing are moving in CREC. Yeah, anyway. and they would land under the patriarchal umbrella. Yep. They would be in full support of that. So there are some social media or a lot of social media voices there um, that would be in support of patriarchy. So... Um, patriarchy Mm -hmm. means that the man is the leader of his household. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the church? There were a number of points that defined patriarchy that I found. Um, And maybe you found these also. They were associated with the vision forum. So if you want to write them off as being not worth your time to listen to because that dude was not a good dude, that's fine. But I think it helps to define the position So I'll I'll go through them relatively quickly. The first is God reveals himself as masculine, not feminine. God ordained distinct gender roles for man and woman as part of the created order. Mm -hmm. Husband and father is head of the household, family leader, provider, and protector. Male leadership in the home carries over into the church. Only men are permitted to hold ruling positions in the church. A God-honoring society will likewise prefer male leadership in civil and other spheres. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was one that I think was distinct complementarian would not say that a woman should not run for public office. Most patriarchy, patriarchal position would holders no. would say no. The, the next one is, since the woman was created as a helper to her husband, as the bearer of children, as keeper of the home, the God ordained and proper sphere of dominion for a wife is the household and that which is connected with the home. Mm-hmm. God's command is to be fruitful and multiply, still applies to married couples. Christian parents must provide their children with a thoroughly Christian education, one that teaches the Bible and the biblical view of God and the world. Mm, mm-hmm. And and then both sons and daughters are under the command of their father as long as they are under his roof or as long as they are the recipients of his provision and protection. So we've talked about this a little bit too in terms of daughters being under the headship of their father until their headship is transferred to their husband, mm-hmm. as opposed to probably the complementarian or certainly egalitarian perspective that you're just free balling out there on your own. <laughs> Which sounds great, but actually sucks. I don't know what that's like because <laughs> like. I'm not a woman, but, <laughs> but it sounds like you feel that that sucks. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great that you're just out there on your own, you know, empowered woman. But every empowered woman deep down wants a man to lead her. Mm. That's, a, that's a bold claim, Heidi. It is I think bold. the feminists are not going to like you for it. <laughs> I don't care. I don't think they like you anyway, but... <laughs> yeah, I think you lost that a long time ago. I did. Sorry, Jill, you were going to read for us. Yeah, some mm-hmm. biblical, just some biblical context yep. to this. So I'll start with 1 Corinthians, um, which was interesting because we talked about this one previously, but uh, 11 verse 7, a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. Uh, because of the angels because of the angels. We need to do a whole episode about head covering and thing. what on earth does that mean? That's a whole or, I, I'm sorry, thing. What in heaven does that mean? Yes. <laughs> the because angels. of the angels. I, but that's not that's not our conversation today. No. Anyway, another interesting yeah. which we talked about. We actually talked about this under the, com- the complementarianism that the complementing is directional, directional not bidirectional. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you made the point in those tenants um from the vision forum, right, that God is male uh yes descriptively masculine. and masculine and ariana grande sorry about it <laughs> i don't know if i'm sorry though <laughs> I mean. uh and one of the uh scriptures that uh, the p- biblical patriarchy does actually like to use is the fact that also we in the lord's prayer start with our father and it is this headship 
the representation of fathership, what that means, right? And that is what we are calling out. Another fun one is Genesis 2 and I think 2.18. It's, it just calls out that the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suited, suitable for him. So woman as a helper, not a leader, not in charge, not the ruler of the family uh, or the household, but a helper for the man. Um, so, so can you help me understand then, this all still sounds like the same thing that complementarianism was. So what's the difference? Yeah. How is it distinct? I think that the biggest distinction is then going to be in Ephesians 5, 22, and that is when it begins to call out specifically that a woman should be submitting to her husband. Well, I don't think that complementarianism, complementarianism also said that. Mm-hmm. Their roles in marriage are that the complementarian view of marriage asserts gender-based roles in marriage. A husband is considered to have the God-given responsibility to provide for, protect, and lead his family. A wife is to collaborate with her husband. Interesting that they say collaborate, hmm. respect him, and serve him as his helper. Oh, marriage. they don't say submit. That no. word was too scary, too. Right. But it says mm. collaborate. Collaborate. Stop. Respect collaborate him. and listen. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So I think that, yes, that a big stopping point would be submission. And that in fa- in Ephesians 5, 22, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, and then now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives sh- should submit to their husbands in everything. Um, I think that the... M- Biggest difference between patriarchy and complementarianism is that the feminists have decided to go ahead and distractingly and successfully make everybody scared of the words patriarchy and submission. Mm -hmm. Because definitionally, complementarianism won't even use the word submission. Mm -hmm. And many people won't use the word patriarchy. Yeah, it says that a wife is meant to respond to her husband's love for her with love in kind and by receiving his service and leadership willingly. So they say submission without saying the word submission. Okay. Then why not say submission? Because right. they're and nuanced. Why not bros. say patriarchy? <laughs> yeah. The, the one scared. sentence that scared, I found. scared, bro? Yeah. <laughs> not me. <laughs> The one sentence I found that distinguished complementarianism and patriarchy said that it was mostly a distinction in degree and emphasis. Mm. So they're hinting at submission, but they won't go all the way to the degree of saying wives submit to your husbands. Mm -hmm. Uh, The emphasis on the ontologically equal as opposed to the, well, we would say probably ontologically different as well as functionally different. I like to emphasize the equality part by leading off with uh, of equal value, which again, everyone agrees with that. Nobody right. disagrees with the equal value part. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, and then sneaking in the just generally equal, right. I think underneath that. And then feminists using scary words yeah. against patriarchy, right? Like I would say one thing I found that I liked was that suppression and submission are not the same. Uh, right. Yes. Yes. Suppression is something that the husband or the patriarch Correct. does. Is Submission doing. is something that the wife does. Right. Submission is something that the patriarch is receiving. Yes. Because he's living up to that high standard well. Right. But suppression is when the man abuses his power. Yes. Yes. It can occur when that, yes, abuse yes. occurs. Now, yeah. I, I would nuance what you said there, Jill. Uh, that submission is only warranted when he lives up to the high standard. I think that we would say that submission is expected in the same way that living up to the high standard is expected. Yes. But just as if the woman doesn't submit, the man is not any longer held to his high standard. So also if the man fails, because all men fail, the submission does not get just chucked out the window. Right, yep. Mm-hmm. And I would agree with that. But anyway, I, that was one of the things that I ran across that I liked a lot was that just the point that suppression and submission are not the same thing, yeah. though. 
feminists have lumped them together and said, oh, you said that scary word submission, so you're just trying to suppress women and abuse your power and whatever other buzzwords they like to throw in there. Um, or and a, a wife who gladly submits, it's like, oh, you're being abused, you're being yeah, yeah. manipulated. Are you, are you oppressed? Like, does, yeah. does he... You just don't know that you're oppressed. <laughs> you're just happy in your own little bubble. Yeah. yeah. If you, you really don't... knew, you could be as unhappy as I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> and so it, it is it is very interesting, and it's one of those things that man, between the feminists and the purple-haired cat people... Um, there's so much confusion going on right now that I'd argue, right? There's, there is no space for what, what's the obfuscation, obfuscation of clear biblical truths. Cause I think that patriarchy is a clear biblical truth, um, and complementarian, like complementarianism, complementarious, mm -hmm. like to obfuscate that. They want to say the, the right thing without, right. Just without saying. saying the thing. And so instead we do, we need a. We need to reconquer patriarchy. We do. Mm -hmm. right. It sounds really, like, I still am scared of that. Okay. Because I still have that negative connotation in my head. But when you really look at the way the Lord designed patriarchy to be, I, I think it can be the same or better than complementarianism. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that we think that we need all these different words and that women need all this oomph to have power when in reality, the gender gap is, it's just not there. It's yes. the opposite <laughs> of what we think it is. Um, this is a 2024 article that I found that women earn 50% more college degrees than men. We're nearly 20% more likely to be hired than men. And women outnumber men in every Christian denomination. So this idea that we need to have women in leadership in order to bring women into the church is just... False. The egalitarians should be celebrating right now. Like right. that sounds like they won, which I mean, kind of they have been winning. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know. But like this that's idea that we, we don't have enough women in church and we have to bring women to leadership. No, no. It's clearly the opposite. We do not have enough strong men in churches. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we can talk about how I think that's partially because the modern evangelical movement has feminized church. But it's just yeah. wild that we're talking about how awful patriarchy is when there are minimal stories that I've ever heard that these men are too strong. They're too <laughs> yeah. patriarchal. It's like, what world do you live in? I see a lot of women complaining about weak men, men that don't lead. Yeah. So yeah. it's like we have the problem at hand, but we complain about a problem that we don't have. Okay. Well, this, this has been a helpful discussion for me. Like I knew what these words were, obviously I've been throwing them around for a while and the members mm -hmm. have heard them come up, but to just be like, okay, what do we actually mean when we say these things? Cause I know we've said patriarchy and maybe there have been some listeners who have been like, <gasps> toxic masculinity. Oh yes. The worst. Um, and if you think that a strong male figurehead of the family is toxic masculinity, then I can't help you. We should have a, we should sit down and talk about why that is. Maybe you should go to therapy for that. Yeah, right. I'm not even kidding. Like Yes, because we would say that a strong male leader of a household is a good thing. And right. so if you look at that and say that's bad and that's wrong and I hate that, that's a problem with you. That is not a problem with patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we have a lot more things that we do want to talk about in this space. Yeah. But... We have been putting out really long episodes recently. And so for the sake of those of us who edit these episodes, as well as the embers who listen to them, we're going to split them this into two parts. So we're going to, you know, yeah. we'll talk a lot more about this and some of the like implications. What does this mean? Some different thoughts that we have in our next episode. So we're going to wrap with some mortal spirits and then we're going to send you on your way. So, uh, a bit of mortal spirits here. Mm -hmm. This is not actually a spirit. Um, so no. It's actually kinda... the bottle reads free spirits. Free spirits. Okay. And it says it's a non-alcoholic, the good spirit of great cocktails. 
Uh, they describe we'll be the judge of that. Correct. They describe it as the spirit of tequila. So it's a non-alcoholic tequila substitute, uh-huh. which we've done one of these before. Heidi brought one. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, but the Jalisco. Got, so yeah. The yeah. I think Jalisco is how you'd mm-hmm. probably say that. Um, but since we've got Nick on here, we're going to be doing some of these NA options a little bit more frequently. Yeah. So we got another NA tequila here. Yeah. Uh, the description yeah. says a fiery agave kissed non-alcoholic alternative to tequila with vitamin B and functional ingredients. Huh. I, I don't know what. As opposed to non-functional. Non-functional. I don't like those um, ones. That say they help ignite your energy and they help... Uh, Elevate your mood. Wow. Wait, this is amazing. I mean, you haven't maybe. even tasted it yet. I don't care. Ah, uh, the the bottle already won her over. <laughs> so if you were to have something that tasted like grass clippings, oh, but you... it had vitamin B and elevated your mood, you'd be all over that. Hundred percent. Oh, this if it elevated I... my mood, I might be all over that. <laughs> <laughs> my yeah, I drink nasty stuff all the time. Because it elevates your mood. <laughs> I mean, can we're, we're, we're clipping that. Can yeah, yeah. But I would like to note that. Can, Actually, I can confirm that. What was it? The yeah, the can confirm. She made me try. Whatever. She made me try mood juice, digestive bitters. Yeah, that's the one. And, you sprayed on your tongue. And what was the other one? There were I had three. to take a shot of whiskey. Liver juice. Liver juice. Liver juice. Liver juice. Liver juice. Uh, yeah. The, uh, yeah. I don't care how it tastes. Oh, so I bad. Did, I didn't mean to laugh because I I love this stuff as much as she does. Do you actually? Yes. Are you? We both blink twice if you're. <laughs> no, no. I know. I know how it sounds. I know how it looks. Everyone, but no. I'm before I even met Heidi. Yes, that's why I love him. I didn't have oh. to train him. <laughs> oh, didn't have, oh, wow. Oh, wow. oh clip that I'm, too. Yeah. <laughs> just, Keep going, I'm Heidi. Just being serious. I didn't have Are you guys e gals over there or what? <laughs> I don't know. What are we? I will gladly submit to the things you already do. Now that you're, now that you're on camera. <laughs> All right. So so does that have any like tasting or smelling notes or anything? Oh just uh, the, the kissed by agave, whatever. It has agave a, kissed. It and doesn't smell bad. Mm-mm. It has That's like a, a charcoal. Yeah, yeah, there's it definitely says like a charcoal. Fiery somewhere. and earthy. I didn't know how to describe it. Thank you. No, no other nodes. It's kind of almost like a, a little bit of like a bubble gum. That oh. might be the fruit and vegetable juice. Oh, <laughs> Wait, it really is. In it. <laughs> why, why did we have to be putting that in our fake tequila? Why can't we just have like... <laughs> Good, because yeah. then you can make your drink, and instead of feeling hungover the next day, you feel rejuvenated. Well, All right, there is no liquor. So All right, well... Next, well, next time... Next mortal spirits will have alcohol, but we'll, I will also make like little margaritas using yeah. this stuff. And then we'll see if it holds. Because that was, I think, what we said about the last one is that by itself, it was just like, ugh, but if you mixed it, it might be okay. So yeah. we'll taste this. Kay. All right. Cheers. 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 Tink. 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 Oh. Oh. It's, it's like that flat Sprite taste again. Oh, it is. Ugh. It's just Shoot. not great. Okay, it Shoot. has a little bit of a burn, but it, it doesn't hit like alcohol does. Alcohol is a nice, like, immediate, nice warmth. It is, I knew exactly this is less talking. painful to drink, I think, than the Jalisco to really? me. Mm-hmm. The other one, it, there was more peppery, I thought. But it is. It's kind of just flat Sprite. This is better than the Jalisco, absolutely. I didn't like it. Man, with the way it smelled, I had higher hopes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The sweetness in the taste just ended up, it like literally fell flat. Yeah. Or in the oh, smell. No. Sorry. It's to definitely taste. like you had that pepper, but it's not mm-hmm. the same burn. No. There is distinct woodiness though. Mm hmm. But I think that's more in the scent than the taste. I feel like yeah. Heidi had a mixed drink with Sprite in it, and it was all flat. There was just a little bit left, and I drank it. <laughs> it was like her backwash. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> mm. yeah. Okay, so right. I think that if if one time is anecdotal and then two times is science, is that how that works? Sure. I don't know what science I don't, is anymore. NA yeah. tequila is no the good. The science trademark. NA tequila by itself is and I think we so we had the bourbon also and that was disappointing for the most part. 
I have not found a, an NA spirit that I am a fan of straight. Now, we didn't really give the N.A. bourbon a fair chance because the, the old-fashioned I made was not all that great. Mm -hmm. I think we could make a legitimate uh, margarita with this mm -hmm. and, and use, like, the rest of the real ingredients and make it actually non-alcoholic. So we'll try that next time and see if that helps. Yeah, sure. But I will say, as I drink more and I have everything, I drank the whole cup, it definitely has a better taste, that last swig I took, for whatever It, it doesn't taste bad but it doesn't taste like tequila right, right. i think no. that's consistently what we come up with is yeah. if you're looking for the same thing as the alcoholic version just non-alcoholic that's not what this is no i could drink that whole bottle uh, yeah but would you drink it because you're like i want to have a tequila shot so i'm no. gonna do my salt lime that's shot. why i'm irritated salt shot lime yeah you, it's because you drink like it as juice I could because drink, it tastes like juice. Exactly. I could drink yeah. it as juice, which is fine. But the whole point of tequila is that you only want your shot. You want to yeah. hit it quick. You want to cough and move on. Like Right. This uh, also is reminiscent of like aloe. Have you had aloe juice? Oh, that, I drink it every day. That's, yeah. that's what I'm tasting. That's it, what I'm tasting. It's kind it's, of like oh, You could put all your bitters it. in that. Oh, totally. You could and, and you would enjoy it in the morning. Yes. As a juice. Oh, because I do that with aloe one. juice right now. Yeah. I take my shots every yeah. morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. I could use that, certainly. It has good stuff in it. Honestly, maybe, I, maybe I'll do that. It's supposed to give you, you're supposed to be in a good mood, and it gives you vitamin B, so. There you go. I, I don't know that I'm in a better mood, though. <laughs> I think my mood has remained the same. Well, I think I'm kind of in a better mood, so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. Well, that that was uh, Mortal Spirits. Thanks for <laughs> tasting with us. I I say it every time. We're gonna do alcohol next. <laughs>